fruits of our lips this morning. Amen. Amen.
God Almighty God, we give you glory, Lord. You are the mighty God. We worship you.
the Lord. We want to thank the Lord for this is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are glad in him. Can we please humble ourselves and we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, King of glory, almighty God, everlasting King. We bless your name. Daddy, be thou exalted in the mighty name of Jesus. For all that you do and what you shall continue to do, Father, we say thank you. For your glory and power, your goodness and mercy, Father, we say thank you. Daddy, be thou exalted in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray, King of glory, that as we go into your word, Spirit of the Lord, give us revelation and understanding. We bind and cast out anything contrary that wants to rise up against us during this session. Spirit of the Lord, rule and have your way. Take charge in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we say thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, we prayed. Praise the Lord. The Lord is good. He's gracious. The Lord is merciful and he has brought us this far and we pray that he will continue to be God in our lives. Uh, beloved, today we are looking at the um, petition, the first petition in prayer. We are asking the Lord in prayer why it is important. Many times we do a lot of prayers, we quote scriptures, but we need to understand which angle or what is the importance of why Jesus was teaching the disciples and giving them uh, the mode of, payment, of, of prayer, how they're supposed to pray. Something we want God to do for us, or God is saying that his will is very important or paramount. So let's go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Uh, you know, by the grace of God, last week we looked at thy kingdom come. Uh, because now Matthew chapter 6, verse 10 tells us, thy kingdom come. We are still looking at that scripture. That was a bit because in that same scripture it says, Thy kingdom come full stop. Meaning that that alone has to be digested to the core. And we looked at, uh, looked at it last week. And one of the reasons why the body of Christ faces a lot of contention from the pit of hell, there is already a ruling kingdom on this earth. Existing kingdom running on the earth. And now we keep saying we want God's kingdom to come. There's going to be war. There's going to be contention. There's going to be a battle. So as we are saying God's kingdom to come, it ha there's a full stop there. And then it continues to say there will be done on earth, comma, as it is in heaven, full stop. So before God's will can be done on earth, as it is in heaven, the kingdom first has to come down. The kingdom first has to come down. So... God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is uh, superior to any other will. And what God formed and put together was lifeless. And he breathed his breath into a lifeless thing which became life eventually. And this life we are talking about is the living soul. Now, the living soul was once a lifeless being. Uh, it was now put together and life was given to it. So we had no form until God came in and made us a living soul. So before even the body came into existence, the soul is the first one that came into existence. So that now be brings out the definition where we say human beings are spiritual, human beings are deep. The spirit, the soul first, then the body comes in after the living soul has been created. So 
This is why uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse uh, 23. I want us to, to see what Apostle Paul was talking about. Uh, we should realize that Apostle Paul was one of the great apostles that had a lot of revelation. He had a lot of revelation. He was abundant in revelation. And uh, let us see what he's saying about the aspect of our body, soul, and spirit. He tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, I'm reading it from the King James Version. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body. You know, he's starting it with the spirit and soul and body. Spirit first, the soul, and then the body. Be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's bringing in three aspects. The spirit not to be found blameless, the soul not to be found blameless, and the body not to be found blameless. Now the question is, the believers that say that God only sees the heart and considers the heart, very true, and he's going to base on the heart. It's a heart affair. But now if there is a speech here saying when Christ is coming, he should find our spirit, our soul, and our body blameless. What does that mean? Uh, we need to pattern and align to what are the systems of heaven that are going to make me align to the agenda of God here on earth. That's the whole point now that we are trying to bring out. So man possesses a will. Man possesses a will. And um, this will that man possesses is normally the one that uh, either makes them uh, successful or destroys them. And uh, this will that man possesses, many times uh, it's about what they want, things their own way, but man possesses a will. And this will is meant to enable one to, be, to bring the out who they are supposed to be. But the danger comes in now when it is our own will and not aligned to the will of the Father. Let us go to Matthew 16 verse 24. Let's go to Matthew 16, 24. We see what Matthew Jesus was saying. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Now the language Jesus is using here is quite, you know, parabolic language. He's saying whoever will save his life shall lose it. When you use your own mind, your own knowledge, your own wisdom, doing things your own way, saying you're going to save your life, Jesus is saying here, you will lose it. And he says, whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. What is he trying to say? We hand over everything about our life to him. He is the one who is the owner of life, and he has the capacity to enable us to live the kind of life we want to live a patent according to what his plan is. When you now read verse 26, it says, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So he's talking about the soul, and he's saying there are many things we chase after by our own will. Because man has got a will, we chase many things by our own will, by our own thinking, and our own reasoning. We want to do things by our own strength, by our own power. And he's saying anyone who does things that way, they will lose it. So we also have uh, the angels also have a will. There were angels that the Bible talks about in the book of Jude that have been locked up. God sent them on earth to teach the daughters and sons of men skill. When they now came, they began to do things that were contrary to what God sent them. And the Bible says, because they were taken, they went out of their course, out of their abode, what they were set and signed, assigned to do. They were now locked up and chained. So angels also have their own will. They were sent to do the will of the Father. When they came on earth, they now began to admire the daughters of men, took charge over everything, and came out in, in line of what they were supposed to do. That's why the book of Jude says they are bound in chains waiting for their judgment to come because they did things according to their own will and not the will of the Father. So even when we get to Isaiah 14, let us go to Isaiah 14 
Isaiah chapter 14, we see what happened there. It's uh, one of the common scriptures. Isaiah chapter 14, and we are going to read uh, from verse 12 to 14. Isaiah chapter 14, and we are going to read from verse 12 to 14. Isaiah chapter 14, and we are going to read from verse 12 to 14. I'm reading it from the King James Version. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nation? Now he, they call him son of the morning because Lucifer means morning star or son of the morning. Now that was his title before he became a devil. So he says, For thou hast said in thy heart, you see the battle starts from the heart. Everything to be adjusted in a life starts from the heart. What a person puts in their heart, what a person pins in their heart, what a person lives in their heart is what affects them and drives them eventually. So he says, thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exert my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high. It started from the heart. Hate starts from the heart. Bitterness starts from the heart. Love starts from the heart. Compassion from the heart. Everything that drives, governs this world starts from the heart. Let us look at what um, the Amplified Version says of the same verse that we have read. The Amplified says, How have you fallen from heaven, O light bringer and day star, son of the morning? How you have... Now, Amplified is telling us the role... Lucifer had because before he was thrown out of heaven or before he was thrown out of the presence of God, the things he was doing. He was a light bringer and a death star, son of the morning. And remember, he was the one heading the worship uh, in, the, in heaven, worshiping heaven. So he was bringing light, was a light bringer. Wherever worship would take place, the dimensions of worship, light would come upon. And the Bible says he was the only anointed cherub. So he was the only anointed er angel of all the angels. That's why there was that uniqueness about him. That uniqueness about him. It says, how you have been cut down to the ground. You who weakened and, lied lo and laid low the nations. O blasphemous satanic king of Babylon. And you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of assembly in the uttermost north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So it's giving us a definition of what Satan was thinking, but bringing us from the place where he was in, high above how he was, the honor and glory he had, and then all of a sudden, he comes down. So many, many times when we decide to do things in life, we need to put into consideration what I'm planning to do. Is God involved in it? Is God aligned to it? Is God aware about it? David, before he went into the battle, he asked God, shall I go and pursue? God answers him and says, yes, you will pursue, overtake, and recover all. So we need to inquire of the Lord in whatever move we are going to make, in whatever step we are going to take. Anything in life that we are going to do, we need to inquire of God. There are things that you can decide to do by your own will and God is not involved in it. At the end of the day, you spend wasted years. There's a very, very, very bright young man, very bright young man. Um, he says when he was in secondary, he used to have particular dreams of doing things that are unique, and um, in that dream, a man told him, which he believes was an angel, told him that if he's to continue in that path, he will never be broke in life. And uh, the demand that will be needed for him will be on high demand because that is what is going to make him come out to be known by not only Uganda, but other nations in the world. Now, as this gentleman is growing, he has that plan already because he gets these dreams according to what he was saying. When he was in second, remaining God was patterning him for his next level for the university. Now, as he was getting into entry of university, his parents had another plan for him. The parents were like, now you see so-and-so's child is a lawyer, so-and-so's child is a doctor, so-and-so's child is an engineer. Now for you, you also have to go and study to be 
a lawyer. We need those courses that when they hear, they will say, yes, so-and-so's child has come out like that. But you see, parents have their own will, but is it the will of the father in line with that child? Giving birth to that child does not mean um, you're the one to push them up to their last final stage and dictate what they should do. As a parent, you have to pray and align those children to God, pattern them to what God has said. After all, you are only channels to bring them to earth, but every human being is of God. We are of God. We are for God. So we are supposed to align to what the Father has said for us because our Father in heaven is interested in seeing his image and likeness replicated on us on earth. And that's why when you read Psalms 127, it says, uh, if God does not watch over the city, the watchman is for nothing. Meaning that there are those security bodies that God is involved in. There are those people that God gave that attachment, that as task to take charge over the security, to keep watch. So if you get one that God has not aligned to that business or to align to that pattern, the watchman will be for nothing, meaning that God is behind security. He can behind, be a, behind a security company because he has given the owner a vision and said, this is the grace I'm putting upon you. And immediately those people in that jurisdiction, by default, the grace of God is upon them. So his presence is also there. So there is nothing contrary that can happen. He says, except the Lord build the house, the builder is in vain. He's trying to tell us that even in construction, he's there. Meaning they are engineers, that they are architectural guys, they are surveyors, all those that are in construction line. They are those that God has patterned to go follow that path, that he gives them ideas from his throne. He gives them designs and patterns from the throne. Then when they are all, every profession, you find God is involved in that profession. When you get to Romans 13, God says that, do not offend those that are in the government because they are ministers of God. What is he trying to say? In the government system, he's also there. So they are those he will direct to that system. They are those he will put there and position there because he wants his presence in every section on this earth. So when God has aligned a child to do a particular course because he knows what he wants that child, what he wants to use that child for in the future, then you now come and interfere with that process. The child will do the course you want. At the end of the day, you will not see the child perform. You will not see the child work in that field. You will not see the child come out. Motivation is destroyed because you're giving the child what is not aligned and patterned to the child. And that's why if you take note, if you're invited for graduations, many times when the fathers have pushed the daughters or the sons to do particular courses, they normally get that uh, graduation cap and they said, oh, uh, daddy, thank you for taking me to school. Or mommy, thank you for taking me to school. This is your graduation cap they put on the head of the parent. What are they telling the parent? Back to sender. This is what you wanted and I've done it for you. Receive it. Me, I'm now going to follow my path. That's why there are some people after they do what the parents have wanted, they hand over the thing to the parent on the graduation day. The parent is laughing, thinking, oh, I've achieved. But they are not understanding the language of the child. The child is saying, this is what you wanted. Okay, I've studied for you. Now you carry the cup yourself. Then the child will go and start looking for what they have always wanted to do. That is what we call a period of what? Wasted years. Then at times after that graduation, the child is at home with the parent looking at each other. The parent says, go and look for a job. The child says, but there is no job in this line. This is not what I wanted to do. The parent says, hey, but other people are doing it. Uh, then the child says, am I other people? Okay, if it is that you get me the job. That is why we have many people stranded at home, stranded in the streets, because they went and did things according to their own will, according to the will of their parents, and they knocked off the will of God. So we need to know and understand how do, do I pattern to the will of God? We need to always keep back in prayer. And that's why prayer is crucial. And that's why Jesus was telling them, this is how you pray. Um, Our Father which art in heaven, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So for us to do anything on earth, we have to pattern and align to the will of the Father which is in heaven. You just download it. That's why many times when you're praying and you're seeking God, before you do anything, you inquire of the Father. You inquire of him what happens in a dream, in the vision of the night when deep sleep falls upon man, or some get it through open vision, some get it through perception. Any angle it comes in, God is bringing it from heaven. That's why you see it in the spiritual. At times even he can walk you to places you don't expect. At times he can take you to places. At times he will show you or he can assign the angels to come. 
and then they direct you and then they show you. It starts in the spiritual, which is heaven, comes down from heaven. So he's now telling you this is what you're supposed to do on earth. Then by the time you wake up, you have your paper notebook. You take note of it. Take note of it. Then you go back and ask the Holy Ghost. This is what I've seen. How should I align? How should I get there? How should I pattern? How should I be fashioned after the will of the Father in this line, in this way? When we do that, beloved, we shall not miss fire. We shall not go wrong. Everything shall align and fall in place because it would have been downloaded from the throne of heaven and brought down on earth. So many times people pray every time you keep praying, oh Lord, uh, do this for me, do this for me. Many times we pray according to our will. So we, it's like we are pushing God or we are forcing God into our will so that it comes as a success or as a testimony, but it is not his will. So when we look at uh, demons also, they have a will, and that's why they decide to come and disturb man. But now Jesus said, um, I came to give life and give it more abundantly, but the devil came to steal, kill, and destroy. So Satan or demons will come and pattern their will so that one is diverted. And one of the things they still they capture is the mind. The part of the mind that is supposed to make you understand, supposed to make you realize, supposed to make you make a good decision. That's the first thing that Satan steals. And that's why many, no matter how you try to talk to them and advise them, they do not pick it, they don't get it, because what is supposed to make them realize has been stolen by the devil. And then they end up doing the will of Satan. Satan can even make somebody busy praying the wrong prayer. Satan can make somebody be busy doing things in the wrong way, but it will look like God is in it, and yet God has never been in it. So the Bible says that whom the Son of God has set free shall be free indeed. But how do you become free? It is the prayer you align to, the word that you pattern after, align to God, is what will make one free and come out, you know, properly. So our prayer and the word would... Um, graduate us to cultivate into the system of God uh, that the devil uh, doesn't take advantage of us. You know, Satan is always checking, is always checking, is always checking. When the Bible tells us in the book of Job, uh, Job chapter 1, when God was having a meeting with the sons of men, the angels, the Bible says uh, Satan came and sat among them. And then God asked, God is unrealized because he knew that, okay, this guy has come in. So he now asked, uh, Satan, where have you come from? He says, I've been to, up and, up to and fro, going about, you know, the earth. And then God asked him, have you considered my servant Job? Then Satan is now answering God and saying, aren't you the one who placed a hedge around him, around his possession, around his family, around his assets? Five areas that Satan mentioned that God placed a hedge on Job. How did Satan know that God placed a hedge on Job? He was hunting for him. Because the Bible tells us George, Job was a preacher who was preaching righteousness. He was a preacher of righteousness. That's what Peter tells us. So that means that if we say we are children of God, we are living an upright life, we are living a righteous and holy life, Satan is our target. He will keep checking to see what access can he have to penetrate and attack? How can he have access to attack? How can he get in an attack? So for God now to come out boldly and confidently and say, have you considered my servant Job? He's saying, I am confident and I am sure Job, no matter what you try to do to him, he will not lose track of me. Because Job built his heart towards God. He had that intimate relationship with God. He had that bond, that relationship, that friend with God. It took him time to build that relationship. This is the reason, one of the reasons why we keep doing personal retreat, going back to God, laying down the pieces of our life, telling God, here I am, anything that is not of you. I want to know you that I may know you and the power of your resurrection. You know, All those prayers we are praying, we are trying to tell God that everything about me can wait. What's important now is my relationship with you. How is my bond with you? How close am I with you? What is that thing about me and you that I have not still put right to order that I want you to continue to do? So all that, what is he trying to show us? He will always show us any, everything that has to do with our mind, our thought, our attitude, our character. Because he's now saying, okay, since you've come to me, this is an area you need to address. This is an area. The Bible is looking, he's looking for a perfect, clean, blameless, no spot, no blemish. 
So this is why the journey of salvation is an ongoing salvation journey. You cannot say, I've arrived, I've reached there. You have to see your mark 100% in heaven. That's why it's an ongoing thing. And that's why Jesus now simplifies it and says, as you're on earth, you know the Holy Spirit is there to help you. But even you, as you're walking and working with me, keep eating me and drinking me so that you may live. The more we do that, we become conscious of the kind of life we live, what kind of attitude we have, because we know that ah, I cannot keep taking the communion and live such a fake life. I cannot keep doing this and live a li lousy life. It becomes a policy within us because now Christ in him, Christ himself is coming in us. He's coming inside us. He's having a home in us. So we are getting to a point whereby we shall be conscious and begin to hear his voice. We begin to be sensitive and know this is Jesus speaking. This is not because we keep having him inside us. And now he's taking away what is not of him that he fully comes in so that the will of the Father is done. So you just see it's a combination of things that work together. So man can exercise his willpower in a wide range of things or issues within the hemisphere of this life or this world. But all those things that we do, we need to ensure that they align with the will of the Father. Because his kingdom cannot be realized unless we do his will. The kingdom cannot be realized unless it, we do his will. And when he says, thy kingdom come, you're saying we want your presence, your realization of your presence, your person, the consciousness of us knowing your being and your presence among us. We have to get to that stage, but the will has to be done. So God's will first, then our needs after. So God rules over the situation, takes charge over everything. And that's why when you say, let your glory be manifested, you say, align yourself with what is working out in what is in heaven. Whatever is in heaven, you align and work it out and bring it on earth. That's why prayer is very crucial because prayer can only enable us to do that. So when we say, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it envisions out, you know, blending together into the harmony of God's will. We are trying to bring the harmony of God's will together. Not our own will, but God's will. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is an indicator that there is a certain pattern, a pattern of the way things are run in heaven. And the same should be done on earth. And that's why they will be done on, in heaven, uh, in earth as it is in heaven. Meaning earth should bring down exactly what is aligned in heaven. The life we live, everything, what we are studying, where we are working, what we are doing, the kind of life we are living, the ministry we are serving, the kind of people we meet, the kind of people we end up with, settlement in the future in terms of marriage, all has to pattern with what is in heaven to be brought down on earth. Because every person we pattern it with, when we meet, whatever we do, must work in, in, in line with what is in in heaven. So let us look at uh, what Psalms 40 is telling us. Because God has a plan and a will for everyone born in this world. And his will is written in a scroll in heaven or in a volume of a book in heaven. So let us look at what Psalms chapter 40 verse 7 and 8 is saying. Psalms chapter 40 verse 7 and 8. We are reading it from the original King James. It's saying, Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O God, my, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Now, David also had revelation. David had a lot of revelations. When you read the book of Psalms, you notice David had a lot of revelations. There are lots of things that David saw happen in heaven. David now sees a volume of a book that is written about him in heaven. What he should do, the kind of life, the kind of people, what he should have in his life. He says, I delight to do thy will, O God, O my God. He's saying in heaven there is that volume of the book that is written about him that will enable him to do the will of God. So that record is about each one of us has got that record in heaven. That book is there, that volume of that book. It is there. So David is telling us that for us to do or be successful in this earth, we need to pattern and align our lives with the volume of the book written in heaven. That's why God, one of the reasons God called David the up of his eye. David th did things 
did not do anything without inquiring from God. He kept asking God. He went going back to God. He kept going back to God. He had that relationship with God. He had that bond with God. He had that rapport with him that there is nothing in this life he would come out successful if he does not go back to inquire of the Lord. So for him to keep back asking God, going back to ask God, going back to ask God, he was trying to tell God, what is, my, what is your opinion in line with this that I'm doing here on earth? Check in your records, what am I supposed to do? And that's why when you read everything about David, the Bible will tell you that there is nothing David did without inquiring of the Lord. One of the only things that he did without inquiring of the Lord that hit him was when he was supposed to go to battle and he went to the window and he saw the Bathsheba and then he admired her and then sent the husband to where he was killed. That was the only thing he did out of the will of the father and he paid costly for it. He really paid costly for that. So when we do things out of the will of God, we pay costly for those things because the consequences that we face are very severe consequences, very, very tough consequences. Now, that thing that we have read in Psalms 40, we see it repeated in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 and to 9. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 to 9. Uh, some people say it is, um, when you look at the language of Hebrews, it sounds like Apostle Paul's language. Some people say it is Luke. So, because the author is not really clearly stated uh, that wrote the book of Hebrews. But when you look at the language, you see Apostle Paul in that language. Then some people, when you read the book of Luke, you also see Luke, you know. So, it is a mixed thing. But when you look at it, mostly I normally I see Apostle Paul's language you know, when you come from the books of Apostle Paul. Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 to 9. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 to 9. I picked it from the Amplified Version, and this is what the Amplified Version says. Hence, when he, Christ, entered into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but instead you have made ready a body for me to offer. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no delight. Then I said, behold, here I am, coming to do your will, O God, to fulfill what is written of me in the volume of the book. When he said just before, you have neither desired nor have you taken delight in the sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. We did this in the beginning when we had started this series all of which are offered according to the law. He then went on to say, Behold, here I am, coming to do your will. Thus he does away with and annuls the first former order as a means of expitiating sin, so that he might inaugurate and establish the second latter order, the will of the Father. He died on the cross. This is what the scripture was talking about. So this tells us how it is very dangerous for any of us just to live a life that we want or think without putting into consideration that there is the will of the Father. And that's why Jesus had to come, died, was crucified, and he rose again. And the Bible says he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Now him being seated at the right hand of the Father, what he came to do, he finished it at the cross. And that's why he had to go for the Holy Spirit to remain behind. So when the Holy Spirit now remains, he's supposed to teach us all things. Because the Spirit knows the mind of the Father. And that's why one of the prayers, the best prayers to pray, as we pray with whatever demand we have, let us pray with tongues. Let us pray with tongues. Because that's the Holy Spirit praying with us, helping our infirmities. That's what Romans 8, 26 says. He helps uh, our weaknesses or helps with our infirmities. We don't know what to pray about. We are in situations that we don't know what to do, how to solve those situations. And now the Holy Spirit is coming in. So when we go into tongues, the Holy Spirit now comes and takes over. And then you will take note that as you're praying those tongues and you're a person who studies the word, scriptures now begin to drop. Now you begin to pray in the spirit. That's when you pray with scriptures and with the spirit praying in tongues. In all that, the Holy Ghost is at work. 
Now, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 14, 2, that when we speak in tongues, it's as a known language, but it is a mystery unto God. He's saying it's the language of God. Acts of Apostle tells us it is a language of angels. So when we go into tongues, we bring down God, and we are communicating to God directly. We are communicating to the angels. The Holy Ghost is also praying with us, and he makes intercession for us. And that's why at times the tongue changes. The tongue changes. At times even the tone changes of the tongues, because now we are lining with what the Father wants. That's why praying in tongues is a good thing for every believer. At times you can pray with understanding. That's why Apostle Paul says, I will pray with the spirit and I'll pray with understanding. I'll sing in the spirit and I'll sing with understanding. There are times when you can sing with the words you understand. You pray with the words you understand. For example, you say any power assigned against me, that's praying with understanding. Because you know that there's a force, there's a power against you. But the question is, which particular power is done behind you? So now when you pray that prayer, he says you pray with the spirit and you pray with understanding. So when you pray that prayer and then you go into tongues, you go into tongues, you go into tongues, at times you begin to now see things in the spiritual realm. You take note, you take note. That's why when you're praying, you have a notebook and a pen because there is a message God will give you. But if you just pray in tongues without a notebook and a pen, you stand chances of not getting mysteries. That is faith. And the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. Some of us say we prepare, but I've not seen anything. The question is, have you prepared your realms to receive anything? How do you prepare the realms to receive something? You get a notebook and a pen and put there. So as you're praying, at times scriptures drop, you take note of them. At times a message can come and you take note of that message. That's how God will trust you and keep giving you more revelation and releasing things unto you because now he knows you are responsible. You're not a careless prayer warrior. He knows that you're a responsible prayer warrior and you take note of events. So all that when we do that, you're praying according to the will of the Father because now you're getting to hear and know from him. Now, when we still go back to David in Psalms 139, verse 16, I'm going to read it from two different Bible versions, the original King James and the Amplified. Psalms 139, Psalms 139, verse 16 says, Thy eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect, that in thy book all my members were written, which in, con in continuous were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Now, for him to say, my members, in thy book, all my members were written. The members is talking about the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, the hands, the legs, the feet, the organs of our body. They are all fashioned in heaven. So when we do things wrongly and affect any of those members, we shall be questioned. We are going to be questioned. So it's not saying, this is my life, this is my body, I can live it the way. It's not your body. It is for God. Everything is patterned in heaven. So when we read verse 16 of the Amplified, it says, Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book all the days of my life were written before ever they took shape. So before even we came into our mother's womb, we already existed in heaven. But now for us to be brought to earth, we had to be downloaded from heaven and they had to look who are those vessels that are going to bring these people into existence. <coughs> that is how our parents come together. They meet so that we come on earth. Now he's saying in your book, all the days of my life were written before ever. They took shape before we came into existence. All our life was written in that book. The friends we are supposed to have, the people we are supposed to meet, the people we are supposed to work with, people we are supposed to work with, where we are supposed to go, where we are supposed to be, everything is in that book. So meaning all the good and bad things that have happened in one's life are in that book. So there is nothing new that you will say, oh God, you're just seeing. He already knew it would happen. That's why his David is now bringing our, to our attention and making us understand that in your book, all the days of my life were written before ever they took shape. Are you seeing? Before they manifested, they were already existing. Before the things happened, God already knew. Before what we say has happened, it has already happened before we even came to earth. That is what David is trying to bring, draw an attention to us. So when as yet there was none of them, you see, before we existed, it happened. How precious and weighty also are your thoughts to me, 
O God, how vast is the sum of them. So God has got a thought that he has got for each one of us. So we need to know what are those thoughts about us. God is so much interested even in what we think could be minor. God is so much interested in it. So much interested in it. He is not happy when he sees us living a careless life, a hopeless life, life a useless life, a senseless life. God is not happy because he's now saying, why are you living such a life? And according to my plan for you, that is not it. He wants us to get him. He wants himself as God to get involved in every aspect of our lives. And that's why we need to know his thoughts about us. When he spoke in Jeremiah 29, I want us to go to Jeremiah 29. From verse 11 to 14, Jeremiah 29, from verse 11 to 14, he says, I know what I'm doing. This is the Message Bible version. I just love this version for this scripture. You know, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the thoughts I have for you, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a good expected end. That's the original King James Version. But now the Message Version says, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you. This is now God speaking. Plans to take care of you. For you, you're chasing after one decola like this, one sugar mommy, one sugar daddy to take care of you. God is saying, I have plans to take care of you. You're rushing ahead of his time. He said not to abandon you. You're already saying, God, you have left me. You don't care about you. He wants your heart. He wants you to draw close to him and be patient and wait. That's why I said each one of us, it's good we pray in tongues. When you pray in tongues, beloved, things open up, things unlock. No matter how the power thinks it calls itself, it cannot stand your way because you're praying with the angels of God. You're praying with the language of God and God himself is answering. So there's going to be angelic reinforcement, divine reinforcement. And then the Holy Spirit is making intercession with you. That's why the burden becomes lighter. He says, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. When you call on me, this is now verse 12. When you call on me, when you come and pray to me, I will listen. So let us call on him. Let us pray to him. That's why we keep telling, oh Lord, come and search my heart. Search me and know where I've gone wrong. Try my thoughts. Try my anxieties. That's what Psalms 139, uh, 23 and 24 says. You know, come and search my heart. Try my thoughts. We are calling him down. Reveal yourself to me. Where have I run short of you? Where have I missed it? I lay down the pieces of my life. This is where all these prayers come from. Because you want his will to come. Verse 13 says, when you come looking for me, God is saying, when you come looking for me, meaning... Separate yourself and give time to seek him. You will find me. Yes, when you get serious, see the language is used. When you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I will make sure you won't be disappointed. God is saying he will make sure I will not be disappointed. How many people have disappointed us? How many? But he's saying you come. Get serious with finding me, meaning... Make it a routine. Be serious. When you say you're going to pray, pray. When you say you're going to fast, fast. When you say I'm going to do this, do it. He said God's decree, I will turn things around for you. I will bring you back from all countries into which I drove you. God's decree says bring you home to the place from which I sent you off into exile. You can count on me. God is saying count on me. Count on me. So for us to know the will of God for us, we need to go back to pray and hear from him. We need to turn our hearts back to him. We need to build that thing, that kind of prayer. Oh Lord, search my thoughts. Oh Lord, search my mind. I lay down the pieces of my mind. I lay down the pieces of my heart. I lay them on your altar. We are doing that continually because we are trying to say, God, I have done things my way. I now want your will. I want your thoughts. I want your ways to come and rule and take over. We need to get serious about finding him. Personal relationship, consistency is the way to go. If you're not consistent, there's no result. You cannot do something once and you think it is going to get results. You have to keep doing it and doing it and doing it until you get results. You don't fall out. You don't wear out. You hold on to it. 
after after we go back and he shows us the right way to take he will then turn things around for us for him to say that you can count on me is an assurance he's trying to say that this is me you can never go wrong you can't go wrong because i am the owner of the universe i am the one who does it all so we have about three kinds of wills mentioned that we still need to, that are still connected to god but of all the three wills we need the perfect will of god and that is what leads and aligns us to purpose. That is what aligns us to that volume of the book of record in heaven. That is what is going to bring down the kingdom. That is what is going to make us successful and work according to God's plan. The perfect will of God is what fashions us after the book of the volume. The perfect will of God is what connects us to purpose. Why God created us and the reason why we are living why he wants us to continue and remain on earth. That is the reason why we need to have the perfect will of God. When you are born, God's will is encoded in our heart. His will is encoded in our hearts. The day we are born into our DNA, where does drama come in? When the parents don't have the fear of God, when the parents don't walk in the will of the Father or they are not of God, they now start to take the child to make incisions, to cut for protection, take the child to the shrine. They are already diverting the child out of the will of the father. Why do they do that? Because they are ignorant. They don't know that there is a volume of the book of that child that has been brought on earth. They do not know that there is something about that child that they need to hear from God and know for that child's life to be aligned to what God has said. So this is why David said in Psalms 40 verse 8, I delight to do your will, O God, and your law is within my heart. So because certain things cropped up in one's life, it does not mean that, you should, that those things should dictate how your life should be. And that's why the Bible says when a righteous man falls down, he rises up seven times. Don't let what has let you fall and you sleep there, you stay there, get up and move. Life is all about, you know, you fail here, you keep moving. You fail, you keep moving. You fail, keep moving. But as you put your focus to God, he will strengthen you. Some things happen to people for, for them to mature. Some people have to happen for people to come to realization that life is not about people. It's about God. That's why people draw closer to God when there is a tough situation in difficulty. And that's why they normally say, do not judge a man or a woman by the state of humility when they lack. Judge them when they have money. Judge them when things are okay. When they, when they are broke, those, that's when you find the most humble people. You tell them, sit down, they'll sit. They say, run, they'll run. They don't have anything. When they hold money, go and ask them the same thing. You, you, you'll even call Holy Ghost fire. They will assure you, they'll put you to order. They'll even tell you who are you to talk to me. So you don't judge a person by the situation they are in. You judge man when they have come out of that situation is when you know the true who they are. Many people, you've been putting in a lot in your friends. You're there for your people. Now you're in a tough situation. None of those people you got time for that time when they needed it have come to your rescue. And at times God, when he wants to change a life of a person to a proper line, there are things he will allow to happen in a life for you to know who is truly your friend and who is not your friend. You know your true friend when you're in a tough time. You know your true friend when you're in difficulty. You know your true friend when, when things seem to be tough. That is when you know your true friend. So many situations have happened because they don't know where to be. They were in the wrong place. They were in, 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 uh, at the right time, in the wrong location. We need to be at the right place at the right time. When we are at the right place at the right time, things will align and pattern well. Not every place is the right place. In the Bible, we say that God is everywhere true. But you can relate to God anywhere and everywhere but the manifest presence of God is not everywhere. It has to be in a particular place he has set for it to be. When Jesus was speaking to the disciples, he told the disciples, I will meet you in Galilee. Why didn't he meet them? He was with them in Jerusalem. Why did he send them to a particular place, Galilee? Why didn't he give them what he wanted to tell them in Jerusalem? So that was the right place to be at the right time. So if Jesus said Galilee and they went to Capernaum, even though they would call upon his name, 
Yes, it is the name is calling, but they, they went to the wrong place. So what they were supposed to get in Galilee, they will not get it in Capernaum. So in, in, in it all, had tough situations come to ensure that we find ourselves, even though tough situations come, we should ensure we find ourselves at the right place at the right time. When you're at the right place at the right time, you meet the right people, the right advice, the right direction will be given, and the right solution will be given. So it pays to be at the right place at the right time. If you find yourself in God's will, this enables one to be what successful. So in that way, you're in position to pursue all the goals that you desire. We saw this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that what is good and acceptable and a perfect will of God. You need to prove what is the will, good will of God, what is the acceptable will of God, and what is the perfect will of God. You need to renew your mind. And for your mind to be renewed, you're not supposed to be conformed to this world. Don't follow the advice and the systems and the fashions of this world. When you follow them, there's going to be a problem. That's why I'm saying renew your mind, because you must prove what is that good. You must know what is the good will of God. Yes, the good will of God is God wants me to do this. It is a good thing. The acceptable will of God. Yes, God wants me to have the acceptable will of God. This is his acceptable will. So when opening the word of God, for example, or let us look at the good will of God. In general, there are many things we need to do. It is normal for us to... To, to get what we have to get, you come out, you have to, 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 to maybe get a job, you work. It is a good thing uh, for you to say, I need to set in the future to get married. It's a good thing because the Bible says it's, not, it's a good thing for a man to get a wife. Good. It's a good thing. It's the will of God. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to help people. It's a good thing to do good things. It's a good thing. That's the good will of God. It's a general will. It is something good. It's, it is affecting you positively, goodly. But is it aligning you, to, aligning you to the purpose of God? I want to go and preach the gospel in a particular place. Because Jesus said, go ye to the world and preach the gospel. But has Jesus sent me to that particular location? Do I have the capacity to counter territorial forces of that location? When, remember when Apostle Paul was coming in and he wanted to go to Asia, East Asia at that time, minor Asia, to preach. What did the Holy Ghost tell him? Don't go. And yet what he wanted to do was a good thing. So at times, we do things that are good, which is a good will of God. It is general because the Bible says, preach the gospel, win souls, do good. But what is the end result of that thing? Are we aligned to the original? When you look at the acceptable will of God, yes, it is a nice thing, but God wants it for one person, and he might not want it for the other. What works for me might not work for you. It can be acceptable for me, but not acceptable for you. Because my future is not your future. My grace is not your grace. So we need to understand what works for me, what doesn't work for me. Prophet Balak said to Balaam, I want you to curse Israel for me, and I will pay you. And then Balaam said, I won't do that. And Balak said, you, you don't want to be rich? So that was an acceptable thing, you know. Uh, Balaam was, was anointed but broke. So and he needed money, and Balak had money. And that's why if, if you are anointed and you don't have money, hey, there's, there's nothing much you really do. Because at the end of the day, realities of life need money, cash, bunda, to change things. So sometimes people die in the acceptable will of God. You live the life of the ordinary man. It doesn't matter in the kingdom. No change or shift of the kingdom. You don't, you, you, what you do, you don't take place. Uh, you don't take your place in the kingdom of God. You don't manifest the power of God. Whatever is supposed to be shown, you don't see it because you're in the acceptable will of God. You get into trouble in the acceptable will of God. You get um, things that you cannot sort out. The acceptable will of God is not the right place to be. And many are in that comfort zone of acceptable, acceptable. We need to target the perfect will. The perfect will is what we should target. This is the highest. The perfect will is the right place to be. It's so important for us to find the perfect will of God. This is God's calling upon our life. This is what God has destined for us to be. This is where we find and meet purpose. 
So you have to prove what is the perfect, acceptable will of God. So beloved, as we are winding up, Isaiah 55 verse 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we need God's thoughts in every thought of our life. We need his ways in our ways so that we can align and pattern to that book of volume. When you read that Jeremiah 1.5, very amazing. Prophet Jeremiah was born before he was formed in the mother's womb. He, was, he already saw himself in heaven because he existed before. Just like what David told us, everything was already set before even we came into existence. So God's will is what encoded in our DNA or in our heart. So at the right time, the Lord will make us known to him. And this is what we learn. This is a lesson we learn. When Jesus prayed the will of the Father, let us go to John 6, 38. This is what is now closing for, for today. This is where we are closing. John 6, 38 to 40. I read from the original King James. It says, for I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is my father's will, which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone who seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at that last day. So, beloved, Jesus says whatever he did was the will of the Father. We also have to do the will of the Father. If you have noticed that you went out of the will of the Father and God has been revealing it to you, go into prayer and fasting and cry one prayer. Father, align me back to your will. Take me out from this place I put myself in and align me to where I am supposed to be according to your will. Such a will shifts when you've gone into prayer and fasting. You lock yourself, switch off the phone, turn off everything and face the Father. Beloved, God is merciful. He will bring you out. That is the way you can come out from your own will when you've come out of the will of the Father and you want to get back. You go into prayer and fasting. It will beat that flesh. The fasting will beat that flesh. Take you into a state of humility. And then the spirit man will be crying. The soul will be crying. All the realms of the spiritual, the soulish, and the bodily realms must all be one. Then you cry to the Father, I am here before you. I have run short of you. I went out of your will. I chased after lastly desires, the last of my eyes, the last of my flesh and the pride of life. Draw me out of your will. It drew me out of your will. And now I want to come back to your will. Realign me. Repattern me. Put me back to track. God is faithful. He will put you back to track. So we should to also pray to the Lord every day for his will to be done in our lives every day. As you're going to work, you're, as you're going to school, whatever you're doing, we need the will of the Father every day. That is how we are going to pattern to that volume of that book and record. That even when our Father in heaven comes, we'll have no fear, we'll have no worry, no anxiety. When we hear there's persecution, when we hear things are going to come up, we'll have no fear because we are aligned to what God has said for us. And wherever we align with it, there's a grace that sustains us for that. So beloved, you're there. You walked out of the will of the Father. I've given you what to do. Go into prayer and fasting and seek him. You are still in a state of confusion. You don't know where you are. Still go back to God and say, God, reposition me. Show me where I'm supposed to be. Bring me back to the Bible says when you pray and seek him, he said, be serious in finding him. It is all about prayer that will draw us back. After you do that, you now see everything align and pattern to you. You're there. You've never given your life to Christ. You've just been floating about, following people online, different preachers. I want you to repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that you died on the cross for me. With my mouth, I confess that you are Lord over my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving and accepting me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I can connect your children, King of glory, into thy throne of mercy. Any condition from their foundation that wants to rise up against them because they have confessed Christ as Lord and Savior, we count and intercept it in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray and decree that let your spirit of truth rule and take charge in the name of Jesus. We count anything contrary that wants to rise up and rage against them in the mighty name of Jesus. Let your power, let your presence rule and take charge by the power of the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. Thank you, everlasting Father. 
In Jesus' mighty name we prayed. Get in touch with us, our numbers online. We have our online foundation class, very important. And then more details you'll get to know as you join us and the Lord will continue to hold us. God bless us all. The Lord keep on sustaining us. The Lord help us and hold us that every day we walk according to his will. Let us hold this and continually pray for his will to be done in our lives, our homes, our business, and everything about us. And the Lord is faithful. We shall see his goodness. God bless us all. Let his face continue to shine upon us. It is well with us. God bless you.